Hello everybody, this is Dr. Wang from Weber State University. Uh, in this series of videos, uh, we are going to continue uh, exploring the 24 Chopin etudes. So today we are doing the famous Tristus, uh, Sadness, Opus 10, number 3. Um, well, this, this piece bears more than one nickname. Some people call it uh, Farewell. Um, this is because of the uh, music critics, right? I don't think an, any of these nicknames are from Chopin himself. And, and there are many stories about this piece, how uh, one of his Chopin's closest friend, Gutmann, uh, claims that Chopin said, this, I, it's hard for me to ever write another beautiful melody like this. Um, well, do we believe this claim 100%? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, it's a tradition in the Romantic period to make up stories. And of course, them being very close, it's possible that Chopin may casually mention how he liked this piece or how this piece is the most beautiful, but um, we all say, this is the most or this is the best in our lives. I don't think we should uh, take that very, very seriously. But this is indeed one of the most beautiful and loved uh, pieces ever written by Chopin. Um, a lot of competitions will exclude this piece uh, in their standard repertoire or in their choice of Chopin etudes because this is a slow etude. It does not show the velocity, uh, the fleet of few fingers. Uh, however, uh, don't get me wrong, this is a very difficult piece to, to play and, and to, to play well. Um, because like Schumann said, this is the etude of one hand accompaniment with the melody simultaneously. Meaning the right hand has two jobs, right? One is to play the singing melody beautifully, the other is to try to be an excellent collaborative pianist and control the middle voice as well. Um, and why is that such a revolutionary technique or something so hard to master? I remember exactly 10 years ago when I was a student, I attended Music Academy of the West in Santa Barbara great memories and met many many friends and of course what, what I gained the most is from the great teaching of Mr. Lowenthal and uh, after one concert he, he, he after each concert he would always take everybody out uh, for great food and, and good time and once he um, during the the dinner he mentioned to everybody he said oh um, I think God created us backward uh, if our thumbs is on the outer side of our th uh, our hands our lives will be so much easier because the m important melody and the important bass line are designed for our weakest finger, the pinkies, right? If we were built this way, then the thumb will do the, the, the dirty work and thumb is the strongest. However, he said, um, after 70 years of practicing piano, he showed us his pinky. His pinky is, I guarantee it, is much thicker than my thumb. So after 70 years of practicing, of working hard on voicing, on, on playing melodies, his, his pinky did grow so much uh, in, in the fingertips that the, this meat, that the flesh is really uh, great for, for voicing. Um, the other um, interesting fact about the, the very beginning of this, of this piece, um, it, the tempo is marked lento, Ma non troppo, like not too much slow, right? So a little bit faster than, than lento. But Chopin originally marked this vivace, so lively, fast, as if he did not realize the beauty of this piece in a much slower tempo. I mentioned this, uh, I'm quoting from the greatest Alan Walker. I, I really enjoyed his new book about Chopin's life, uh, released two years ago. It's it's really something worth reading. Um, 
another interesting fact about this A section, the singing section, is that Chopin breaks the very commonly used pattern of a symmetrical phrasing, meaning two plus two or four measures plus four measures. In this piece, the opening is the opening phrase has five measures, and it's five plus three. So this fifth measure is really something kind of like a, a, a added measure or kind of like a sigh. many many voices okay as I mentioned how the right hand has the job to play the using the weak fingers to play the singing melody while the thumb and second finger the strong fingers play something super quiet left hand has this interesting uh, syncopated motion an accent on the long notes, on the middle note. And to be honest, it sounds great when we play with object. It really gives us this up motion or to continue motion. Uh, I think for me, one of the greatest challenges of playing this piece is to that I, I want to always stop. I want to enjoy the moment. I want to sing expressively. But if we stop all the time, right, to put it in my uh, doctoral uh, teacher's uh, uh, words, uh, Nalita Chu, uh, to, to put in her words, uh, she always say, should you do not smell every rose or every rose you pass by uh, you can smell the, the most beautiful one but not everyone so that because it cuts this continuity of the piece it cuts this motion so i think we can use the left hand syncopated pa the patterns to help us to keep the rhythm going all right um i think in terms of of tempo of rhythm Another great exercise for us is to do tempo rubato or to practice how to correctly, properly do tempo rubato. Uh, measure 7, measure 8, Chopin put strato, which means a little bit hurried, a little bit going forward, and then to get slow. And of course, this is a typical rubato. The word rubato means to steal or to rob. Um, there is a great book by Dr. Hudson. Uh, it's called The Stolen Time. Um, it, it's a very thorough book on, on the history of different styles, different composers' use of, of tempo rubato. Um, I think I always think of rubato as of a, a bank, right? You, you take some money, you put it in the a, a different account, but you have to pay it back, right? It's a credit card. So it's not only one direction it's to slow down. It's, it's always something like you, you hurry a little bit and then you make up the tempo later or, or soon. Times we, we don't we only see retanudo or ret relanto we only see these but we don't see a uh, strato I think here is a great lesson for us to learn how to do it properly okay the middle section of course has some uh, technical challenges as well mainly the thicks right uh, opus 25 there is another piece whole whole piece dedicated to 
to a six. But I think in in this case, not only uh, it's it's the the interval that is challenging. A lot of times we have to face a lot of stretches. Um, and here Chopin uses um, a very interesting harmonic uh, treatment called chiaroscuro. Um, chiaroscuro really means. In, in the in the visual art, uh, it means light and shadow, um, and uh, of course this is not started by Chopin. Like back Mozart, back with with Bach, and I'm pretty sure before Bach, a lot of composers uses it. And basically, they they do a back to back major feeling with with minor or the other way around. <laughs> Treatment. We can use a little bit of uh, rubato to show this different contrast of, of the color. And here in this half diminished broken, um, I would practice. I would practice the different chord positions. I will memorize my hand position of each chord and, and then try to find the notes uh, when, when it breaks in two. Um, in measure 38, I know Chopin puts a long slur over eight notes. And again, in my, in my teaching, uh, I always emphasize the differences between the musical phrases and the technical phrases. Of course, ideally they're, they're together, right? We, we finger differently in order to make sure musically we do not break the hand position, we don't change the hand position, we don't break, we don't technically break a, a musical phrase. But in this case, I think we have to think it separately. Um, I would break them into two notes groups in terms of the technique. This is one position. And then practice them like this. Of course, when we put them together, we don't let people to detect that we're breaking them. We're only breaking these to find the hand positions. And here, measure 40, uh, 38, 46, that's one of the hardest the challenges of this whole piece. Um, such a wide stretch. And, and uh, to be honest, I can actually... I can, I can reach this with one hand position, but it's super awkward and it gives me great tension. Um, I think when we do stretch intervals, I often would like to think of one finger as the pivot finger. So this, when we go, to the, we will, we go from outside interval to the inside interval. For both hands, I would like to practice with my second finger being the pivot finger. To hold it and then play outside note and two inside note to measure exactly how far my wrists need to turn. When I go out for the next group, I use my third finger. To measure exactly how far I need to reach for the outside. And of course, Relax every group. Relax and stay closer to the keys. Um, okay, so this is the uh, what what I want to share uh, with you guys uh, on this beautiful etude. Uh, next week 
we are going to explore Opus 10, number 4. Uh, just a little bit of um, uh, interesting fact. Uh, Chopin originally put an uh, attacker at the very end of uh, the third etude, meaning so after the third etude, to go directly to number four and if we compare key relationships number one and number two C major A minor relative major minor number three number four E major C sharp it's another pair of relative major minors so very likely Chopin had this in in his mind that he wants to play to to compose this in in pairs but unfortunately he did not stick with this with this rule, right? The next one is the black keys, and, and then C major happens again in number seven, A minor happens again in, uh, in the uh, opus 25, number 11, so he, he, he didn't stick with using all keys. However, we can, with that in mind, maybe when we play maybe all Opus 10 or all Opus 25, or maybe when we play a selection of the etudes, if we put number three and number four together, that's something we should do. And let's also keep in mind that with the limited concerts, live concerts that Chopin ever given, he has always played etudes. And many times we don't know which one, we don't know how many, because the program of his concerts just said etudes or walls, uh, but these remained, this collection remained his repertoire until the very end of, of his life and he played these often in, in concerts. So these masterpieces are not just exercises or studies, these are musical character pieces. Okay, so I look forward to uh, seeing you again uh, next week with this next uh, famous Opus 10, number 4. Thank you.